This video will be a rebuttal of the Diamond Brothers video, Magicians Prove a Spiritual World Exists. Now, the existence of miracles is something that Catholics must hold with divining Catholic faith. The oath against modernism states, quote, I accept and acknowledge the external proofs of revelation, that is, divine acts, especially miracles and prophecies. It is not the intention of this video to deny that miracles occur or to deny that sometimes, though rarely, people can be possessed by demons. However, before we attribute anything to demonic power, we first must eliminate all possible natural explanations. Just because one cannot explain how a magician performs a trick, it does not necessarily follow that it is done with demonic power. However, if a magician or any other entertainer is claiming to commune with demons, they should be avoided by Catholics. And it doesn't matter whether they actually are or not. A person who only claims to interact with demons for entertainment purposes should still be avoided. This video will be an examination of some of the world's top magicians. Almost everyone believes that the best magicians in the world only use incredibly quick sleight of hand to perform their quote tricks. Many have the impression that the top magicians are just so good at what they do, that there's a natural explanation for their performances, even if we can't see it or figure it out. The dove frame has been a staple of dove magic for years. In slow motion, you can clearly see the frame opening. It would appear that Brother Michael did not do any research at all for this video. How does this magician perform such a quick change when both his hands are holding up the curtain? Perhaps he is using demonic power, or perhaps it is just a fake hand attached to the top of the curtain. In other words, most believe that there must be a non-spiritual explanation for all the apparent signs and wonders magicians perform. Is he assisted by demons, or perhaps the card is not in the bag, but behind it? So when he moves the bag behind his hand, he palms the card, then in a swiping motion, dumps the card in a bag attached to the back of the table. For example, there is no way without supernatural assistance that cards can instantly appear in someone's hands out of thin air. But as you can see, that is exactly what is happening. Okay, well, I like to do the routine as follows like this. Let me get another card here. I will first start off with them in this position. Do the pivot move that we learned in the first video. Keep the cards in motion so each of the five cards now are in the back of the back palm. And I come up, I produce the first card. I show it, I take it into the left hand like this. I come up, I produce the second card and I place it in this almost fan-like motion. All right, I produce the third, I produce the fourth, boom. And now I'm gonna have ample cover to pivot this around so I can almost take my time with it so I make sure that it doesn't flash because these cards are a cover so I can pivot around, show this hand, this side of my hand empty, turn it around, show this hand empty, you could do this, and now produce the last one just like that and place it into a fan. All right. Yet most will still insist, despite the clear evidence to the contrary, that these magic acts do have an explanation that doesn't require the supernatural to be involved. They will say that being this good at magic is only the result of a tremendous amount of hard work which has enabled them to perfect their craft. But that can't be the real explanation for how these individuals are able to perform this kind of magic. Notice how the ball bounces up and down, giving away the trick. The ball is suspended on a line, which has been edited out. You know, it's funny. Even in this day and age, they still think magicians use their sleeves. So all you do is cast a spell, and there's the A so far. The Ernest Color Change is one of the best to perform in real life. So at the same time that you put your uh, hand face down, you turn over your hand and extend your fingers, you are going to push with the pinky the top card. So from the edge, it looks like this. Okay, so you already have that window created. It looks more natural because you don't have to do this movement. Pam, pam. You already do it in this motion. Now you are ready to get this bottom card with these two muscles, move it, and perform the color change. Also, don't perform the color change like this. 
do it in a more magical way. Do it, so you grab this car and you do it like in a natural motion, like so. In fact, there are multiple techniques to perform a color change that do not involve the supernatural. And it's going to apply pressure downwards. So the car will move perpendicular to the deck, like so. So the car will move perpendicular to the deck. So now this is all the technique you need. You need to be able to move the car from the top to the side perpendicular to the deck in a really fast motion, like so. So practice this a lot of times and when you have it consistent, you only need to add a second hand on top. This will cover this car and will allow you to perform the color change. They could only perform these signs and wonders with the assistance of spiritual forces. As we will see, this has even been admitted by the top magicians. It is entirely possible that this is not an illusion, but is actually performed with the assistance of spiritual forces. However, there are a few things that point toward a natural explanation. The first thing to notice is that it is evident the person is not balanced on the sword, but is rather supported by a kind of back brace. Also, the tip of the sword is a gimmick that retracts inside, and the back support has a slot designed to insert this gimmick sword, and it can clearly be seen that the sword does not go through the body, but is actually retracted into the hilt. At the same time the sword retracts into the hilt, a fake sword tip appears at the stomach to complete the illusion. In this video I will provide overwhelming evidence that most of the top magicians, whether they know it or not, are possessed. Well, the bottles are gimmicked ones, and Matt uses two tubes to magically move these wine bottles and glasses around the table. Now, there are three sets of bottles used for the trick, and each set contained two more bottles inserted inside it. Also, all the bottles were empty and didn't have their bottoms, and each bottle in the same stack were slightly different sized to make the stacking possible. This made it possible for all the bottles to be stacked up on top of each other and conceal those glasses. To magically move the glass from one tube to another, all Matt did was to leave the stack of bottles on the glass in the first tube and lift off the stack from another tube to reveal the glass. Also, the three bottles in every stack had a hollow cutout near their mouth, which made it easier for Matt to identify the number of bottles he wants to lift or leave behind with the use of his fingers. So, here's how the bottles were arranged and hidden inside those tubes. The first tube had a set of three bottles. Also near the mouth opening of the third bottle in that set, there was a small compartment built in which holds a small amount of wine. Now there were three glasses used for the trick, and Matt smartly used them to make it appear and disappear. Magicians, whether they know it or not, are possessed and that they are certainly assisted by demons or fallen angels. This woman simply walks up to a certain area in full view of others and begins to levitate. Some might argue that she is able to hold her body weight up with her cane, but that argument fails because she removes her hands completely from the cane and still levitates. In some instances she will switch hands, this is unlike other street performers who appear to levitate. Their arm or one side of their body remains connected to a metal box underneath. Those street performers are hooked up to a contraption that allows them to appear as if they are floating. Also, anyone can watch those street performers and see that at the beginning of the day, they assemble their device. And at the end of the day, they disassemble their device. The fact that those performers are not actually levitating can be discovered by anyone who waits until the end of the day to see their contraption disassembled. But this woman from Brazil walks right up to the crowds and begins to levitate. She is not hooked up to any device. While floating she will switch the hand that holds the cane and even take both hands off the cane. A human who is not using a machine or a device is not able to float in the air without spiritual assistance. One does not want to be uncharitable, but if the Diamond Brothers actually think that this woman can levitate, they seem to have missed something in the thinking department. No one would suggest that these levitating street performers 
are holding themselves up with their hand. The hand is only grasping something to hide the metal support rod, but there is no need for her to hold the cane if her support rod is hidden by her clothing. If this lady could actually levitate, there would be no need for her to have a cane at all. Brother Michael says that this woman walks up to a certain area and begins to levitate without a setup. But what does he think is under her carpet? What he says is actually so absurd that we must consider the possibility that Brother Michael is only making some kind of a joke. However, there is nothing in any of his videos that would indicate that he had a sense of humor. Some may ask how I believe these magicians became possessed and fell under such demonic control. Most of them became possessed by attempting to contact spirits or by fooling around with the occult. Some of them may have sold their souls to the devil. In return, the devil gave them special power, fame, and fortune in this world. First, you have to put glue on your neck. I like to use Elmer's rubber cement glue. What I do is I put a little bit of glue on my neck right here, and then you let it dry. So when you take the string and you put it against your neck, all you have to do is look down, and it gets stuck to itself, and it looks like the string is going through your neck, but it's really just the skin catching the other part of the skin because of the glue. So now you can pull back and forth and you can yank out and it looks like it's ripping your skin out, but it's really just the glue. You have two lifesavers, not just one. So the first one you really do put in your mouth and you pretend to swallow it, or you could really swallow it. Obviously be careful with that. What I like to do is put it under my tongue and pretend to swallow. So it looks like I swallowed it, but it's actually just under my tongue. The second lifesaver is on the string before the trick even starts. I like to wrap the string around my pointer once and then I hide the lifesaver underneath my pinky like this with the string coming out. So the lifesaver's right there. Take the first one, you put it in your mouth, pretend to swallow it, put it under your tongue. Then you do that little trick with the string and when you yank it out at the same time, you release the lifesaver. And if you pull the string tight, it spins like that. Assistance from the devil and demons is the way these top magicians have acquired these special quote magic skills. All invisible thread is black. There's at least 20 microfine pieces of thread wrapped around each other and that's why it looks this thick. What you have to do is fray the end just by going like that until you see one of the microfine pieces. There's one right there. Then you start pulling it out, pulling it off from the other 20 or so that are wrapped around until you have your microfine piece. There it is. I don't know if you can see this on the camera. I could hardly see it and it's against white. You can make a little loop and hold it so it loops around your thumbs and if you're at a restaurant, say this is a salt shaker or whatever, you've got it suspended on your thumbs. You just wave your hand over it and you can actually move the item like that. And as soon as he spins the ball, the distance between his forehead and the ball remains consistent, and the ball only moves when his forehead moves. The thread moves around his thumb and connects to the steel ball at this moment. You may be wondering how come the performer was able to move his fingers around the levitating ball. If such an invisible thread was connected to the steel ball, there was no way he could have moved his finger right above the ball. Well, in reality, he is not actually moving his fingers above the ball. Instead, he is moving the fingers diagonally around the ball. And the finger movement that he does around the ball at this particular moment is pretty obvious, and the string can be easily dodged since the motion of his hand is not in the way of the string connected to the steel ball. This video will be an examination of some of the world's top magicians. No, it is not done with the power of demons. Once you understand that the fireballs are just suspended on an invisible line, the movement of the balls becomes clear. Notice how the magician places the fan under the line, then lifts it up. The ball then slides down the line into the box. Once you understand these basic principles of illusion, it no longer seems quite so magical. In this case, the line is attached to the magician's hand, which is evident when you notice that the fireball moves in sync with the movements of his hand. And there is no difficulty for the ring to go around the fireball because the line goes to the center of the ring. Dynamo started his professional career in magic by working in clubs and bars in the UK. Basically what you do for this is you are gonna get a loop. The loop is on my wrist right there. They are gonna select a card and while they are looking at the card, you grab the loop 
and then you're gonna put your thumb inside it and when you get the card back you're gonna grab it with the thumb and the index finger of the hand that's holding the deck and you're gonna put the card into the loop like that so now as you can see the card is actually inside the loop and the remaining is gonna be quite simple actually you take the card you make sure the loop is around the center approximately you can adjust it you can have the loop not in the center but more near the top or the bottom just experiment with it and see what works the best but you're gonna open up the deck a little bit less than half ways in most cases you take the card you put it in and right now as you can see there are the loops sticking from the deck you're just gonna put the deck down on the table for this to work all you're gonna have to do is move the hand to the left what you can also do is i like to stick my thumb into the loop inside it and then i will move my thumb and the deck will move a little bit and now I'm in a position where I'm still holding the loop. I'm having it in control between uh, this thumb and this thumb. So if I want, I can let go with this hand. And then I can either make it, you know, fly out of the deck by pushing the hand like that further. Or I can take the hand upwards and the card will fly up. But in this case, I'm going to snap my fingers and move my hand a little bit to the side and it flies out. And then you can take it and flip it over. In this video you will see many examples of false signs and wonders performed by many of the top magicians in the world. This will prove that a spiritual world exists. This trick is rather easy to figure out. All he does is turn the bag. I appear on stages around the world as a conjurer. Now the American term for it is magician. It's not a good expression because if you look in the dictionary the strict definition of magician is one who uses magic. And magic, the definition I prefer from a leading dictionary, is the attempt to control nature by means of spells and incantations. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, in my time, as you might have guessed, I have tried spells and incantations. <laughs> no good. <laughs> you can spell and incant all you want. The lady will still be on the couch waiting patiently to float into the air and will be imprisoned in the box and the saw blade descending upon her unprotected midriff uh, and in some danger of being severely scratched, if not worse. <laughs> Spells and incantations don't work. You have to use skullduggery. And let me make it very clear what the magical trade, the conjuring trade, if Mark correct is conjuring, is the approximation of the effect of a true magician using means of subterfuge and trickery. The magician, if you will, in the American usage, is an actor playing the part of a wizard. We are entertainers. I don't think that there are many folks, but there are some out there, by David Copperfield's own admission to me, who still believe that really he can do the things that he purports to do. Now, after magical performance, I've, we've all undergone the same experience, all of us in the trade. You get people coming to you afterwards and saying, uh, I really enjoyed what you did. Thank you so much for coming. And you say, well, it's great to be here. I'm happy that you were pleased with it. And then they, they, they button hole you and say, but, um, you know, what they, the business with the, uh, you know, with the, the bottles there that multiplied and everything like that, that's, obviously that's a trick. And the one where you, uh, you know, you did the thing with the, with the rings and the ropes. And so that's, obviously that's a trick. But the one where you told the lady what word she'd chosen out of the newspaper, that, that of course can't be a trick. I say, yes, that's a, that's a trick too, but um, it's disguised as a miracle of a semi-religious nature. <laughs> and they wink at you and they say, sure. <laughs> and they walk away and they tell their friends afterwards, well, he won't admit it, but we all know. Brother Michael Diamond appears to have put no effort into researching how these tricks were done. He simply assumed they were demonic. But just because you cannot explain how something was done does not mean that it is supernatural or demonic. In face changing, what look like masks instantly appear on the faces of the performers. It's quite obvious from looking at different performances by Quan 
that he could change his face 500 different times in three minutes. Take a look at this guy. He doesn't even touch his face. Notice how every single time he changes his quote mask, it is placed perfectly on his face, covering his eyes and nose every single time. If someone believes his process of changing the masks is natural, he would have to be storing them somewhere, right? But face changers like Quan take off their hat after their performance. And you can see that there aren't any masks in the hat they wear. You can look at it. There isn't even one mask inside their hat. So where are they storing the masks? Notice how tight the outfit is below the neck. Obviously, the masks aren't being placed there either. What's really happening is that the masks are actually disappearing instantly. That's why even to this day, no video camera in the world has ever picked up even one clue as to how their, quote, masks are changing. No one has been able to give a natural explanation for how these face changers are able to do what they do. The only explanation is a spiritual one. The real explanation for how the instant changes are made is that they happen with the assistance of demons. See, I've been uh, traveling around the world collecting artifacts, items that people say are haunted. They say if you concentrate hard enough, you can awaken the spirits inside these objects and cause the objects to move without explanation. And I brought one of those objects with me tonight. It's that table over there, folks. Pick up the table and bring it down here. And everybody, get down on one knee. Just keep your fingertips lightly in contact with that table. Keep your eyes right here at the center. Right here at the center of the table. Don't press down. Exactly. We're going to try to concentrate and awaken the spirits inside this table and cause it to rise up into our fingertips. But it's important you follow my instructions exactly. I want you to concentrate right here and very slowly. Stand up in slow motion. Feel it rise. Feel that table rise. Slower, slower. Feel it rise. Then it will rise. Listen carefully now. Lift up both hands. Put them back, catch it, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Now this table will do whatever we tell it to do. Table, come this way. Come on, table, move this way. Come on, if you feel it move, move with it. At least half of the participants are stooges who are in on the illusion, plus of course the cameraman, whose job it is to conceal what is actually going on. Also, notice how most of these supposedly randomly selected people were wearing long sleeves. Hidden beneath those sleeves was a mechanism that will extend a rod into the table. Notice also that David Copperfield pulls back the tablecloth to expose holes that the rods will fit into. The rods will extend at the flick of the wrist which are inserted into the table. The table is also very light and can be lifted with minimal effort. By age 12, he became the youngest person ever to be admitted to the Society of American Magicians. This is the type of fishing line that ties the fly on the end of the line. So it's only like anywhere from one to three pounds. This, for almost any performance environment, is actually a spectacularly good uh, dancing cane thread. So you, if you're five feet away from somebody, the lighting is subdued, absolutely invisible, beautiful, beautiful for a dancing cane effect. Magic store thread. This is the gold standard. So if you're doing a performance for a group of people and you really want to have your dancing cane be as professional as possible, not good for practicing because it breaks very, very easily. Uh, but once you've got the moves down, this from three feet away is invisible to anyone. Just to clarify here with our fishing line, uh, it simply is a fishing line which goes down, goes through the hole in the cane, and then it's tied at the top in a loop, continuous loop all the way around. You slip your middle finger through and the distance should give you about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch when you let go of the cane uh, between the tip of the cane and your finger. And you need that little gap so that when the cane flies by it won't catch your hand on the way by. And that is the whole setup for having a dancing cane. So we haven't tried this one yet. Give it a <clears throat> very quick drop here and we'll see if, uh, if this one's going to work. Like I said, it was made out of a piece of something I found in the backyard. So I don't know about the balance. So let's see. Drum roll please. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Looks like it's flying to me. No, he wants his top magicians to come across as balanced, down-to-earth men. Normal people who have cool skills.
Copperfield has done many magic acts that have gone down in history as some of the most astounding of all time. A good magician can easily backpalm five cards per hand, and if they're thinner, gimmicked cards, ten or more. But regardless of how many cards, at some point they will run out and they will need to reload. Here you can see David Copperfield caught with his hand in his pocket retrieving additional cards. In Memphis, Copperfield made a coin fall in slow motion in a person's hand. Fifty years ago, magician James Randi offered a reward to anyone who could provide proof of the paranormal, increasing his offer to $1 million. No one has claimed it. No matter how smart or well-educated you are, you can be deceived. But um, I'm sure you're familiar with Lawrence Livermore Labs. Not too far from here. Lawrence Livermore Labs has a bunch of physicists, um, all PhDs, I'm sure, working uh, there. And uh, I got a call from one of them a couple of years back. He said, oh boy, you're a million dollar prize. It's one. It's gone. That's it. Say goodbye to it. I said, I'll come. Well, a physicist from Israel came over here and brought with him a fellow named Ronnie Marcus. Ronnie Marcus was doing the Uri Geller Act, bending spoons and reading the contents of sealed envelopes and good stuff like this, all stuff which has been in the magician's repertoire for, for generations now. And um, they said, we uh, put him through a test, and he passed. He's the real thing, all right. This is what fooled him at Lawrence Livermore Labs. It's very simple. You simply squeeze some of the skin on the back of your hand into the box as you close the box, and you you know, turn like this, and it rises straight up like that, and then it goes all the way down again. A miracle of a semi-religious nature. Over the years, Copperfield has levitated many people. Concealed inside is an electric motor that is connected to a hydraulic piston powerful enough to support the girl. The steel mechanism is attached to the piston, which raises it into the air. The platform's carpeted top contains the next secret. Two switches are hidden beneath the black carpeting. When the magician appears to be conjuring the power to levitate the girl, he's simply turning on the power to the motor. This S-shaped metal tube is connected to the board. On the first pass, the magician slides the ring close to the board and on the inside of the S. When he comes to the end, he slides the part of the ring that is trapped inside the S back around the other side. This frees the ring from the S-shaped support and makes it appear that it has passed completely around the girl. We floated people outside in broad daylight. And she scared me. <laughs> this is a This is nothing. <laughs> Want to go again? So how does the magician rise up off the roof and float through the sky like a superhero? The secret may come as a bit of a surprise, so I'll let you down easy. He doesn't have superpowers. He's not even in control of his own flight path. The man in charge is right here, sitting in the cab of a 50-foot crane. Dangling from the top of this crane is a set of very thin aircraft cables, the same kind used to make Peter Pan fly on Broadway and in theaters across the country and around the world. Concealed beneath the magician's jacket is a specially designed harness that has been used on stage for decades. Before the trick begins, the crane operator lowers the cables down to the stagehands who attach them securely to the harness. Once they're double and triple checked, the magician is ready to fly with the greatest of ease. But why don't we see the cables suspending him in the air? The secret is the bright sky. Remember I said he wanted to show you his power in broad daylight and that there were no visible wires? That's because the glare from the bright sun and sky makes the wires impossible for the cameras and even the human eye to detect. From the proper angle, the brightness of the sky blocks the cables, making them invisible. The most difficult part of this trick is lowering the magician to a soft landing. How about that? It is done with wires after all. He has even flown through the air while proving that he doesn't have any cables or wires attached.
Note that the rings are carefully manipulated to create the illusion that they actually go completely around David Copperfield, but yet the spinning motion of the rings is done in such a way as to avoid hitting the wires. So these are the fly wires. They're three thirty seconds of an inch. They're just a little bit thicker than, than pencil lead, but they're a lot stronger. Each one of these will hold roughly, roughly a thousand pounds. This is the harness that the actors wear. And this would sit right on their hip. And this swivels, which it gives them the ability to do somersaults. Or they can lie out like Superman, or they can dive down and create all of these amazing body positions. And it's a real easy connection. This is the piece, slide right into the harness like so, and they're hooked up. I started doing magic when I was eight years old, and I was doing professional shows by the time I was 11. I think being a magician and, and an illusionist helped in creating flying sequences in the sense that you're able to suspend disbelief. We all know that people really can't fly. To create that, you work with the actor uh, in motions, in aerialography, I call it. It's choreography in the air. And when they hit a certain point, you just need to angle your body. One of the hardest parts of, of making somebody fly is making it look natural. But when you focus on the actor and have him or her work with the movement and make it look like they're motivating it, then it's going to look smoother. I'm working on this production of Joseph. It's an original production. It's in a dream sequence, and what he does is he flies around the stars and the sun and the moon. If your foot hits it, it still looks cool because you're just melting right back into the rock. He will even carry a person into the air with him as he flies around. My first significant project I worked on Broadway was Peter Pan with Kathy Rigby. It was the quizzential show for a flying designer because that's what you're known for. Everybody knows flying is in Peter Pan. And it was one of the most amazing, exhilarating feelings because here you are on Broadway creating the sequence for the person that's known for Peter Pan. The devil has gradually introduced the masses to the diabolical false religion of magic by presenting magic as if it's harmless fun and entertainment. But Satan uses magicians to deceive people and lead them to hell. In the Old Testament, Aaron turned his rod into a serpent before Pharaoh. Pharaoh's magicians were also able to turn their rods into serpents. But then Aaron's rod devoured the magician's rods. If the Diamond Brothers still think that David Copperfield can actually fly, they should ask themselves, why he is unable to turn his entire body to face the audience. He is only able to turn his head and shoulders. This is because wires are fed through small slits in each side of the box and they prevent him from turning his entire body. Copperfield has worked a number of quote miracles over the decades. There is nothing new about a magician cutting someone in half. It is rather well known that they are only bent in half. David Copperfield designed a contraption that appears to be too thin to bend in half, but this is only an illusion. When viewed from the right angle, you can see that it is actually quite thick, and there is more than enough room for David Copperfield's legs. Copperfield also walked through the Great Wall of China. During this event, the camera never cut away at any time.
He did this in front of witnesses standing right above the wall. Before Copperfield decides to come out completely on the other side of the wall, he only puts his hands through the wall. He then puts his hands back into the wall. A short time after that, he decides to go completely through the wall. What you don't know is that a double is hidden beneath a trap door in the platform. As soon as the shade is in place, the double opens the trap and gets ready for his secret role. We see the magician climb the stairs. The beam of light is focused to shine brightly on the shade, but allows a narrow place for the double to hide. When the magician steps into the fabric cube, he takes the double's place and the double steps forward. The switch is seamless and the shadow appears to be the magician's. Meanwhile, he's busy slipping through another trap door and down into the stairs he used to climb up onto the platform. While we're looking at the shadow, we don't even notice his escape into the staircase. Once he's inside, He's ready to be wheeled to his final destination on the other side of the wall. Whenever magical assistants are wheeling stairs around, you can be sure someone's hiding inside. On the front of the shade, we see the shadow of the double appear to melt through the steel wall. From above, you can see the double's choreography as he mimes melting into the wall and then simply curls up into a ball where he won't be hit by the light. But from the front, it appears he's passing right through the steel. Next, he climbs back into his secret hiding place so that the cube is empty when the shades are removed. The audience believes the magician has melted into the steel wall, but his double is just hiding in the platform. Meanwhile, the staircase, with the magician hidden inside, has arrived on the other side of the wall. While he's making his way from the staircase into the platform, his assistants are distracting us with their own sleight of hand. Remember the cloth panel they held against the steel containers? When you look closely, you can see that only one of each assistant's arms is visible. That's because their other arms are hidden behind the panel with their hands pushing on the fabric. The effect of the hands pushing on the fabric is so startling, the audience doesn't even stop to think it could be the assistant's hands and not the magician's. As soon as they get the signal that the magician is safely inside the platform, they remove the panel and attach the shades to the cube. When the shades are up, the magician climbs out of his hiding place and makes his way to a dark corner, carefully avoiding the beam of light. He holds up his arms and walks forward, creating the illusion that he is rematerializing, melting through this side of the steel containers. Some of Jesus' most well-known miracles were walking on water, multiplying loaves and fishes, and changing water into wine. This is a magician named Yif. He is the most famous magician in China. He has appeared to change water into wine. He says that Jesus was a magician like him who lived 2,000 years ago and performed this miracle. So does Yif actually perform a miracle by producing bread out of thin air? 
Not hardly. The Diamond Brothers may think that it was a miracle, but when Yiff performed this stunt on national television, his method was exposed. The cameraman got too close, and Yiff was unable to hide the tube in the wall behind him through which he produced the bread. But what about the original viral video? In that video, he was standing too far away from the background to use the tube in the wall method. So how did he do it? The answer is CGI. Slowed down and zoomed in, you can see the editing green screen air on his forearm. When you use a green screen in CGI, you should not only be able to produce bread out of thin air, but leap tall buildings in a single bound. He has appeared to change water into wine. He says that Jesus was a magician like him who lived 2,000 years ago and performed this miracle. Trick is nothing new in the world of illusion. In fact, there are quite a number of different ways a magician can use to change the color of a liquid. He may use basic chemistry, or perhaps he may use a colored light. However, in the case of Yif, he used his tried and true favorite method, that is CGI. Perhaps the only magician who uses more stooges and green screen in his show might be Chris Angel. Attempting to be like Jesus, Chris Angel walked on water when he walked on Lake Mead, which is located near Las Vegas, Nevada. Dynamo walked on the River Thames in front of thousands of people. This was the key moment in Dynamo's career as a false Christ and a false prophet. The platforms in this illusion have been constructed in various size planks and are supported by the clear legs that reach the bottom. The platforms are long and narrow and are best seen from low angles. The platforms are hard to see from the sides, so the camera angles are carefully chosen and plotted out to make the trick believable. Now they're raised slightly above the surface, so you can see the gaps in between that the magician simply steps across. David Blaine has levitated and performed many, quote, miracles on the streets of numerous cities. I don't think that what you saw on his TV special is the same thing as what those people saw live. The reactions that they had were real, and they did see what they believed to be levitating. But what they did not see was him going two or three feet off the ground like you saw in the TV special. He filmed one version of a levitation. He got the reactions from the people. Then what he put on TV was a completely different version of a levitation, which the people believe they saw. And that's fair, because that's what we do in magic all the time. I'll tell you all, I'm taking your card. I'm going to place it back in the deck. But I've already switched your card. So the card I'm putting back in the deck is not actually your card. I'm lying. I mean, that's what magicians do. All he's doing is using the tools that he has at his disposal. He's got these cameras and these camera crews. So he can show you one thing live and then put something else on TV with those reactions. So what I believe David Blaine actually did was something called the Balducci levitation. The magician has to get the exact right angle in front of the spectators. And as they're looking at his feet, the magician appears to levitate two or three inches off the ground. What he's actually doing is stepping up onto his right toes, keeping his heels flat, and his left foot is shielding that so it looks like he's levitating. Now, if this is done properly at the right angle, it looks amazing. He had to show something even greater than that. In post-production, he reset the same area up, the same set, he got some wires, and he made himself levitate a few feet off the ground, and it looked amazing. To understand what happened here, we notice in another clip of his levitation, the sun is spilling all over the road, but when he levitates just four seconds later, the sunlight is gone. These are called pickup shots, and they're filmed at a different time than the rest of the video. But even those people who saw him do it live might believe that that's what they saw, but that is not what actually happened. On a number of occasions, Blaine has stuck sharp objects right through parts of his body. Not only does he have no pain while he does this, there is no blood and no evidence of an entrance or exit wound when the blade is taken out. See how it looks like That's the worst thing I've ever really seen in my life. What are you doing? Do you see how really believable oh. you I'm not good with this. That's crazy. You see that? How are you? Wait, what, what do you mean, how are you doing it? You've stuck a needle through your arm. It looks pretty real, right? I'm sorry, I don't understand. How is that not real? What do you mean it looks pretty real? <laughs> well, it looks really real, right? I don't understand. 
Right, okay. Obviously, if that's if that is a trick, how is that a trick? How is that not a needle going through your arm? You know what, Ricky, here, do me a favor. Grab the needle right here. Yeah? And pull it out so you can see the magic trick. Go ahead, grab it. Yeah, good. Grab what do you mean? Yeah, grab pull it, it out, out sure. although it's come. Yeah, yeah, pull it out. Good. Just pull it right out. <laughs> right, okay. Pull it out. Is that needle going through your arm? Well, pull it out and you'll see how it works. Pull it. I don't understand. Oh, David, what have you done? Are you a maniac? This is real. Sorry, this is real. That's real. That's not a trick. Now, it is entirely possible that David Blaine is actually driving a needle through his arm, but it must be pointed out that body piercings do not prove the supernatural. However, there is reason to be skeptical that he is actually piercing his arm. The first thing that seems off about the needle is that it does not just go through the skin, but rather stretches the skin out as it goes. And when pulling the needle out, the skin stretches out with the needle. Anyone who has received an injection knows that this is not how needles behave. When a doctor pulls a needle out of a patient's arm, it does not pull the skin out with it. It is hard to say for sure exactly what is going on in this video. However, the skin behaves more like rubber than skin. It looks as if he has a prosthetic rubber skin on top of his real arm. Perhaps this is why he needs a witness to oversell it. Oh, David, what have you done? Are you a maniac? This is real. Sorry, this is real. That's real. That's not a trick. Chris Angel claims to believe in God and says that he is very religious. He will frequently talk about how he's, quote, blessed. But as we can see, he fully accepts false religions. Uses his tongue to position it under the base of his jaw. Once he positions it perfectly, the coin is hidden between his gums and the inner part of his cheek. This method he employs to hide the coin is a popular method of hiding objects in one's mouth used by several popular magicians. Additionally, we made another observation when he opened his mouth to make the audience believe he had swallowed the coin. Chris doesn't show the base of his jaw to the spectators. Also, when he raised his tongue, he only did it for a moment and the coin wasn't noticed because it was hidden at the base. After the fake swallow, he didn't magically move the coin under his skin. Instead, he wore a fake prosthetic skin right above his real arm. Also, underneath the fake skin is a wire connecting the coin to the strap Chris is wearing on his wrist. Under the strap is a coil mechanism with a retractable string similar to ID card retractable reels. This coil mechanism pulls the coin beneath the prosthetic skin and he makes a fake hand gesture to make it seem like he is moving it magically. Besides pulling the coin underneath the magician's skin, the strap serves another purpose. It prevents the audience from detecting the difference between the color of the prosthetic skin and the illusionist's real skin tone. Also, he intentionally wears a long sleeve shirt to cover the upper part of his arm so the difference in the skin tone wouldn't be noticeable. In addition, we made an observation when the illusionist cut the prosthetic skin. To make sure he doesn't slit his actual skin, he cuts right on top of the coin using it as a protective layer. Additionally, the blood that comes out of the skin when he slits it isn't real blood. In reality, the blade is designed with a small ink cartridge filled with red ink. So when he applies pressure on the blade, the red ink pumps out making it seem like he is bleeding from the cut. When he pulls the coin out from beneath the prosthetic skin, we notice the difference between it and the original coin that the lady signed on. The coin with the female spectator's initials remains in his mouth the whole time. However, the coin he cuts out of the fake skin is a different one entirely. We notice that the signatures on both coins do not match one another even though they have similar letters written on them. The horizontal stroke of the letter A is longer than that of the coin the magician cuts out of his skin. However, Chris switched the coin he removed from his arm with the coin initially hidden in his mouth when the camera was focused on the spectators. This was done to convince viewers that only one coin was used for the trick, whereas we know that's not true. It's totally out in the open. We have nothing, nothing to hide. You all look a little scared. Don't worry, we're just going to send you all straight to hell. <laughs> hell is just like Hawaii, only hotter, with more familiar faces. After you get your flashlights, I'm going to have you close your eyes and picture your perfect place. That's where you're going to go. I need you all to raise your right hand. People in the audience? Raise your right hand, raise your right hand. We're not gonna cut the camera. Keep it rolling. Take him up into the air. 
Witnesses, make sure you can see all the way around the sides and behind. Brooke, over here, Brooke. Stick your hand out the side, right here. Down, 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 down. Good, take this flashlight. And both of you take your seats and tell me when you're ready. Now close your eyes and picture your perfect place. After a man was injured at a show and sued, ABC's T.J. Holmes here with the details. You got it down, T.J.? Well, George, I still don't know how they pull a rabbit out of a hat. But in this case, <laughs> David Copperville makes 13 people disappear on stage and reappear at the back of the room. Well, because a man was injured after he disappeared, we now know exactly how this trick works. And here's a hint, George. It's not magic. Thank you so much for spending this evening with The world's most famous magician forced in a courtroom to pull back the curtain on one of his most famous tricks. David Copperville was grilled in a courtroom about what happened the night an audience member, Gavin Cox, was injured while participating in one of his illusions. You're not responsible to him. Yes or no? I don't think we're responsible. Did you know that Mr. Cox was injured during your illusion? No. Cox says he was part of the vanishing crowd illusion where 13 members disappear from a cage suspended above the stage, then magically reappear at the back of the audience. Cox says he was rushed off the stage and slipped and fell into a dark construction zone causing permanent brain damage. Copperfield's team was forced to reveal that instead of actually disappearing, the people are actually rushed to a different location through a series of backstage passages and hotel corridors inside the MGM Grand. Carol has performed numerous seemingly inexplicable tricks, like this one where he bites off a coin with his teeth, then he spits it out so it becomes whole again. So stay. <laughs> Other magicians have also performed this trick. Oh, oh. Oh. Yikes! Oh my! Hey! Hey! Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> oh no! 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 no. <laughs> The illusionist tells you up front that he is a liar, so when he says that this is an ordinary item, you can be assured that it is gimmicked. If he tells you the sides of this box are solid, you can be assured that there is a secret compartment. When they select a random member from the audience, there is a good chance that there was nothing random about the selection at all. Magic shows routinely employ twins as well as thin-framed, flexible assistants capable of contorting themselves into various small compartments. Their devices are camouflaged in such a way that they appear to be too small for a person to fit inside when they are actually fairly large. Invisible thread gives the appearance of levitation, and there is always the reliable tried and true smoke and mirrors. Get a mirror. Put it under a table like this. See it? Yeah. Okay. Whoa. Ready? Looks good. You can swing your leg. Huh. Nothing weird until one, two, three. In this video, the Diamond Brothers demonstrate that they have no ability to discern the supernatural. There is potential to do damage to someone's faith if you convince them that something is supernatural only for them to find out later that there is a very natural explanation for it. It is irresponsible for someone who fancies himself a teacher to jump to the conclusion of the supernatural every time he is unable to explain something. It is quite frankly inexcusable for him to make such claims, especially when a natural explanation for most of what is in his video is widely available on the internet. Brother Michael Diamond evidently did not bother to do any research at all for his video.